Well, good afternoon, good evening, good night, good... I'm sure I missed one. Morning, I missed morning, wherever you are in the world. Thanks so much for joining us live here for Serverless Office Hours, streaming on the AWS Ch Twitch channel, Serverless Land YouTube channel, and also via LinkedIn Live. So happy to have some excellent guests with, uh, with me today. I've got uh, Jeff Oriakuya. Did I even get that even remotely oh, right, you, Jeff? You got it, actually. <laughs> Well, I promise you I haven't been practicing. And uh, flanked by two amazing EventBridge PMs, uh, Michael Gash and uh, and Jeff. Welcome back to Serverless Office Hours. It's lovely to have the EventBridge team um, back with us. How are you both doing? Jeff, I know you're in Canada. And I know, Michael, <laughs> you're in uh, Frankfurt. That's such a silly thing of me as the host to then ask a, ask a question of two people at the same time. And then you sort of deer in the headlights going, oh, who's, who, who's he talking? Who's he talking to me? Well, Jeff, we're, first we're, of all, how are you? We're we're showing off the Canadian and German politeness here. Yeah. yeah so, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> well known for that. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, well, Jeff and I were just talking about our our, uh, our wardrobe um, collection. We promise you, we didn't sync up with the slightly AWS slash Amazonian colors. Um, entirely unintended, but maybe we just dream too much AWS <laughs> that we dress with it in the morning anyway. <laughs> this is the only shirt I have, um, Julian. Yeah, it's oh, only only yellow. It's a whole closet full. Well, oh, well, at least there's more than one. I was just worried that, um, luckily, we're remote that we don't have to um, don't have to deal with the only T-shirt that Jeff has. Oh, goodness, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, Michael and Jeff are going to be talking to us um, at length about Kafka and EventBridge today. But just before we get uh, get to that, um, first of all, remember we are live, so you can always send us your questions and your comments. Uh, let us know where you are and where you come from. Uh, Nushka Saxena, if I haven't butchered your name. Hello, everyone joining us via YouTube. And we also have so far Summer B uh, joining us via Twitch. So, so lovely to have you. But just looking back over the past week or so of what's happening, what happened in the world of serverless here at AWS, the previous stream on the 6th of June, um, Eric and Brees Pelle had a super cool conversation all about AppSync, uh, serverless GraphQL, and they were talking about two really great new features, being able to federate things. And oh, I can't believe it. I Because I wasn't doing the stream, there was a second really good announcement, and I've... Um, yeah, I got that wrong. But anyway, uh, yeah, AppSync's uh, love doing AppSync, and Brees is a super good, um, uh, knowledgeable person all about AppSync. So that was last week. You can find that at all other serverless office hours on our youtube.com slash serverless land channel. Then in terms of things that are coming up with what's new, if you do um, put your uh, eyes further down the list, you will see EventBridge pops up over there, and that's basically what we're going to be talking about today. But yeah, just some other things to pull out. Um, X-ray tracing, uh, you know, anything that's got more X-ray tracing is always going to be helpful. So if you are using FIFO topics for SNS, uh, X-ray has now got your back, which is really, go really good. For those Ruby developers out there, I know you're absolutely passionate and keen. Well, Lambda now supports Ruby 3.2, so I know some people have been excited about that. So yeah, join the, the Ruby train on Lambda, and now you can use Ruby. Uh, Ruby 3.2. And then also, <clears throat> just the second one down, uh, SQS has a the, the dead letter queue redrive, which you could do via the console. And now some people have uh, been super happy that you can now do this via an AWS SDK or CLI call. Just makes it much better to route those messages around your applications when things do fail. You don't have to do your click ops in the console. You can now do some API action to, to do that. Um, so blog posts just to support some of the launches and some other kind of things. Ruby 3.2, finding out all about that and what the new Ruby functionality is and how it integrates with Lambda. And then Higgy, Sashin, and Jason have done a really good blog, in-depth blog post on API Gateway, private endpoints, custom domain names using a reverse proxy. Now, I promise you, I'm not going to ask you to read that out all really quickly and see how ac accurately you can do it. It's a good tongue twister because there's lots of good information. So yeah, have a look at that and all other serverless uh, serverless blogs um, which we were talking about, which you're talking about. Then Today, so today we are talking about EventBridge and Kafka. And some of you may be scratching your heads going, EventBridge and Kafka, are they similar? Are they different? Jeff, I'm going to throw the ball into your court. Sort of uh, tee us up here what, what we're talking about today. Sure. So, I mean, the, the quick answer is um, they're similar and different. And um, we're, I, I think, a, a great talk for future service officers might be like, which should I use in which situations? But today we're going to concentrate on um, both Kafka and EventBridge are used by many people. Um, we have many customers that are actually using both in the same application. And we're going to concentrate on how we can combine them together um, to take advantage of both. Um, I'm going to begin by just giving like a brief background on event driven architecture, um, which is what Kafka and EventBridge um, both drive. 
talk a little bit about events, and then talk about um, really briefly um, the two really cool ways that you can connect them together. And then hand over to uh, Michael, who's going to um, go in a really deep dive about the coolest new way um, you can integrate EventBridge and Kafka together. Excellent. Well, dear, Jeff, do you want to bring up your slides? I know you had some yeah, things. Yeah, so I guess instead show. of just talking about it, maybe I should actually do it. Um, so, I mean, I think just off the back of it, I think uh, Kafka is fascinating because there are so many wide use cases for it. And I think one of the, I don't know if issues is even the right word, but one of the one of the things that people do with Kafka is they try to pigeonhole, pigeonhole it into the use case that they're already using it for. And, um, you know, it is an event, it can be an event bus, it can be event streaming platform, it can, uh, you know, it's got a super high scale, um, you know, lots of uh, big enterprise companies using Kafka as a sort of backbone of their enterprise. Um, and then trying to find, you know, but obviously wanting to integrate with AWS. And obviously AWS has a lot of Kafka options, you know, very successfully you can run Kafka as yourself on EC2 instances, you know, great integration integrations with Confluent, um, MSK, so uh, managed streaming for Kafka. So that's, you know, lots of people I know uh, who are doing with Kafka go, I love Kafka, but I don't wanna handle with some of that auto scaling and all the, the patching and management of that. So the Amazon MSK is really useful for you. Uh, but yeah, lots of AWS services, just the big picture integrate really well with Kafka, you know, Lambda's got great integrations with Kafka. You're going to hear about EventBridge today, and even Lambda's Kafka integration is not just with AWS, uh, with uh, AWS Kafka. You know, you can you can integrate with uh, on-prem Kafka or Confluent, all these kind of things. So yeah, big story with um, with lots of Kafka in integrations, and more coming with uh, with AWS. So. so Jeff, I have your details there. So trends of event-driven architectures. I yeah. love event-driven architectures. Yes. <laughs> Being part of EventBridge, it's mandatory um, for us to love <laughs> event-driven architectures as well. So I'll just give you a little hook into like why event-driven architectures are important. So customers that are building event-driven architectures, basically, what are the advantages of event-driven architectures? And what have we seen um, from customers when they start using event-driven architectures? Well, the first one is they're able to modernize applications while keeping refactoring efforts minimal. So they can emit events from legacy applications while migrating to a modern cloud architecture, making it a much faster path to modernization. The key to event-driven architectures and what really propels um, this modernization and this um, um, transformation is the decoupling of event producers and consumers. Now, this decoupling is a super important concept, and I'm going to dive way deeper on that in a minute. I think basically every slide I have um, mentions decoupling. Um, the second one I want to mention is that many customers are under pressure to respond to an ever-increasing customer demands, market dynamics, and industry competition. So when customers build event driven architectures, the applications are easier to extend to new features and products, and they can build on top of existing events without changing their existing application. And then the number three one I want to mention here is that many customers that we've talked to are looking for ways to unlock the value of events and data in their applications. They want to build dynamic, high quality experiences. They want to use AI, ML, powered personalization, et cetera, et cetera. And they want to extract valuable insights from their events so they can take action today rather than waiting for a weekly or monthly report cycle. So event-driven architectures allow customers to ingest, process, and take action on events in real time. And guess what? Um, both Kafka and EventBridge can be used as a backbone for event-driven architectures. And customers using either of them can realize all of these benefits that I described. So I talked about event-driven architectures, and I just want to make sure that everyone here is on the same page and the folks at home are following along. So just give me 60 seconds to talk about what events are. Your so in the now. Okay, start time. <laughs> so <laughs> really simply, an event's a signal that the system state has changed. So events are immutable, which means they can't change. The change that the event represents has already occurred. So events have this semantic intent that are usually represented as verbs in the past tense. So what we have here, like an order is created, a customer info was updated, return requested, or return received. 
So in an API-driven world, incoming requests are commands to take particular action. So you see on my little diagram here, it's been like, please send an email confirmation, and then you get a response. You got it, like it's sent. So the producer expects a response indicating an action has been taken. On the right-hand side of the slide in the event-driven world, these requests come with no expectation that an action is going to be taken. It's totally up to the consumer to decide what action to take or even whether to take any action at all. The producer doesn't expect a response. As a matter of fact, the producer doesn't even need to know who the consumers are. So we refer to this as decoupling producers and consumers. And it's the key advantage of event-driven architectures. And once again, both Kafka and EventBridge are really great at this. So let's go like one level deeper from events into what architecture in this customer X just ordered a widget example might look like. It's like the simplest architecture diagram ever. But in this example, the order service, an event producer, sends events to a broker. For example, an event stating that customer X ordered a widget. On the other side, the broker are our targets or event consumers. For example, we have a sales reporting system that wants to record the transaction or an email system that wants to send out the notification. There may be some targets that only care about certain types of events, or they only care about the orders for a particular account, or they may want to hear every event. The event broker or router takes on the complexity of ensuring that the consumers can get the events they want to get from the producers. This is the main job for both EventBridge event buses and Kafka. But how they do it is where we begin to see some differences. So Kafka is an event streaming platform where different producers publish streams of events into topics. Consumers then pull from these topics to get those events. Kafka's job is to store those events durably and reliably for as long as the consumers want so they can pull them from the broker. Now, EventBridge event buses are event routers. Subscribers tell EventBridge which events they're interested in receiving using matching patterns against events metadata or the event payload itself. So a matching pattern and the targets to invoke when that match occurs is called a rule. So producers publish their events to the bus without using topics. When an event's published to the bus, every rule on that bus is compared against what the event contains. And event bridge's job is to make sure that any rule match triggers an invocation of the target or targets associated with those rules. So a lot of words, but basically Kafka consumers are pulling against Kafka topics they're interested in. While an event bridge consumer gets events pushed to them when that event matches one of their rules. But either way, you get this event-driven architecture style of decoupling. So what source should you use, Kafka or EventBridge? Um, any answers on that one, Michael? No, just, just kidding. The short answer is that it depends. So we have many, many customers that are using both services, even the same application. For example, a customer could use Kafka to run analytics on the event streams to detect financial fraud. And if fraudulent activity is suspected, they can actually put an event on EventBridge so other teams in the organization can react in real time. So today we're going to concentrate not on which service Kafka or EventBridge you should use, but on how we can use Kafka and EventBridge together. So I, sorry, Julian, but I can't come to a serverless office hours without talking about pipes. And pipes is um, pretty relevant in this one. Because one way to connect Kafka with EventBridge event buses is by using EventBridge pipes. So pipes is an EventBridge service that lets you make point-to-point -point connections between sources and targets. And in this example, you can send events from Kafka as a source to an EventBridge event bus as a target. Pipe supports consuming from six sources, of course, including self-managed and managed streaming Kafka, enrichment through four services and delivery to 14 different services 
including H3 endpoints via API destinations. And of course, pipe supports delivery to event bridge event buses, as I mentioned about 30 seconds ago. Now, central to pipes is the ability to filter. Um, you get to choose which events from your specified Kafka topic get passed onto the event bus, and you're only charged for the events that match your filter. Pipes, filters, and bus rules use the exact same syntax. The enrich and transform step can be used to add data to an event or change the schema to match what your target expects. Now, these two steps, as people know pipes, the filtering and enrichment, they're optional, but that's the secret sauce, which provides pipes with a lot more power than simply connecting services together. But pipes isn't for everyone. Um, the other method to integrate Kafka's event bridge is the Kafka connector for Amazon event bridge. Many of our customers are using pipes right now as a simple fully managed method to connect services together. But if your team's already using Apache Kafka Connect for other integrations with Kafka, or if you require registry support for Avalon Protobuf, Kafka Connect for Amazon Event Bridge could be a better solution for you than Pipes. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to click on here, but I don't know what that's actually going to do. Okay, probably you're just seeing a black screen because I'm not even sharing this. And are we still seeing your your um, presentation? Cool slide. Okay. Well, let me share this one then. I'm going to share. I'm just going to share my whole screen because I'm feeling daring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to show you is, um, okay, is this working? You're seeing a repository? Yes. Here? yes. Cool. Yeah, we can see the repo. So this is the repository for Benbridge Cafe Connector. Um, it's an open source project. And I'll hover over this icon here. I don't know if you recognize this fellow here, um, Michael Gass. Um, he is the um, other person on the call that's been waiting to talk. So actually, rather than me describing more um, about what this does and why you should use it and how it connects Kafka and EventBridge, um, let me just hand this over to you right now, um, Michael, and you can give a, uh, um, a little rundown on what we're going to see and what you're going to show us. Cool. Thank you, Jeff. This was like an amazing introduction. Uh, did, did you just come up with this or because it felt so fluent? Uh, really nice. <laughs> I, I came up with it last night. <laughs> but, um, um, right. Yeah. Um, stay tuned for more presentations by Jeff O. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the whole, I, th I think the whole event of an architecture thing is so interesting because I think once once people get it, it's sort of, you know, it's one of these big business slash IT light bulb moments that really yeah. goes off. And it's such an enabling thing. But there is a sort of a hurdle or something to step over to be able to get it and just, but it's actually not that, it's not a complicated concept. You've just got to sort of understand it. What I would suggest as well is Werner Vogels in his reInvent uh, keynote last year had a whole great section on asynchronous architectures. And it started really nicely talking about uh, the difference between synchronicity and asynchronicity, which plays a lot, lot, lot uh, into it. Not going to steal his thunder, but it, it was a really visual way to explain how event-driven architectures can be helpful. And yeah, I mean, even you know, personally, the kind of applications I'm working on and can see in the future, and I've worked in enterprises for years and years, having joined AWS and seeing the power that Kafka and event bridge and uh, step functions and all these kind of things can do, I sort of cast my mind back to literally so many applications I supported and think, you know, life would have been so much easier using an event-driven architecture. And that was just me. We didn't we didn't um, implement them, even though they're well-known ideas, because event-driven architectures are super old, but some of these old event bus um, uh, services and products were, you know, pretty difficult to use. But with a serverless approach now, it is just so much easier. So really all the old architectural practices that you know enterprise architects of 20, 25 years ago loved the idea of it, but it was just hard to put into practice. You know, now that reality is here with the with the serverless approach, um, which makes things much easier. So yeah, if if you if you don't get the event driven architectures, it's worth just spending a little bit of time um, on serverlessland.com. Literally the front page has a uh, a link to I'll post it over here as well, all about the, the basics of event driven architectures. It's worth just a few minutes to you know, spark those neurons and get the light bulb going. Yeah, I mean, you shouldn't have mentioned event-driven architectures to me because I can talk about that for like a full hour. But I guess one thing I'll say that's like really exciting is now that um, serverless and event-driven architectures kind of combined. Well, event-driven, sorry, event-driven architectures has been around for like many years, like 20, 30 years. 
But we're seeing this really neat inflection point now where we have this wide stable of customers that have adopted event-driven architecture and have all these cool stories about how much time it saved them, um, about how much easier it is, um, about how more resilient it is. They have all these like really cool stories. And now that all these great stories are coming out, other customers are beginning to take notice and beginning to make the plunge. So we're going off from this like big risk of this first adopting that was happening over, I would say, the last 10 years to becoming like really, really mainstream because people are seeing all the advantages it brings. So it's a really neat time to be involved with event bridge and event driven architectures. Absolutely. And um, just to also talk a little bit about some anecdotes, customer anecdotes that we, that we hear this, um, like if I would categorize my customer meetings, it's either meetings where customers ask, oh, we want to embrace event-driven architectures and we are thinking about using EventBridge. We are not sure. We also heard about Kafka all the other way around. So wh why should we use EventBridge? Like those are more like these expl exploratory um, um, customer conversations. And then the other type of conversations that we have is like, okay, we already have technology X, be it Kafka or EventBridge. And now we have a specific need or use case to integrate the two uh, together. So often customers start with a specific solution and then they realize over, over time that as they become successful with, their, uh, with the decision to go event-driven, that there are so many use cases that one technology alone often won't cut it. And that could be for, like, for many reasons. So for example, while EventBridge is super easy to use, serverless, as you go and as you grow model, you can't run EventBridge uh, in your own data center because it is a cloud-based service. So that's why often customers choose Kafka for on-premises environments. And we know that customers are like not binary, whether they are fully on the cloud or also on-premises, or some of, some of them are also on their way to the cloud during migrations. And so we have these uh, requirements that often, even if a solution fits perfectly, Customers uh, need to think about alternatives or orthogonal uh, approaches. And that's why, you know, these conversations to me are always not event bridge versus Kafka, but in the end, they are always like, how, how can we combine them? Like use them efficiently in a better together approach. That's how we position this. Yeah. And you, you won't hear me talking about um, that, like pushing uh, Kafka down because I've spent a couple of years before I joined AWS working with Kafka and I find it's a great technology. It solves a lot of great use cases. And, it's kind of reinvented event streaming as well. Um, at the same time, I love EventBridge because it's super simple, super easy to use. Uh, and I love the power of the rule pat pattern matching, which we'll talk about today as well. So why, why don't we just combine them, right? Um, so that, 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 it's, it's think... great to know that we are, I mean, the, you know, a product manager for EventBridge coming from a big Kafka background. Secretly, Michael's also comes from a Kubernetes background. So they're two Ks. So maybe we'll call him Special K Michael. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the big K products, we got, got your expert in here. Yes, we already had one on the other K recently on serverless office hours, um, which, by the way, is a good, that's a good segue. Um, because Kafka is often used in Kubernetes environments. Yeah. And um, a lot of customers don't know that we also have an event bridge integration into, into Kubernetes. So you can manage your event buses also through Kubernetes with the uh, AWS controllers for Kubernetes, the ACK project. We did a show, uh, I think in May, Julian, right? Yeah, Was it? I'll put up the link here. So even if you're like, oh, I'm on Kubernetes and um, I love Kafka because I can easily deploy it through Kubernetes, Yes, you can do the same for EventBridge as well. So from a tooling perspective, there's like we also have this kind of harmony and you don't need to learn new, new tools uh, if, you, if you want to manage EventBridge from Kubernetes. But we're not into that one today. What we'll discuss today is uh, what Jeff said earlier is the EventBridge Kafka connector. And the main motivation behind there, why we built it was obviously customers asking for it. And those customers were often, they had a Kafka environment, a Kafka estate, and they were like deeply familiar with Kafka. Um, they had the tooling, they had the processes, they had the understanding. But then there was at least one use case where they found EventBridge would be a nice addition to their you know, Kafka event backbone. And uh, obviously Pipes is what, you know, you Google Kafka event bridge integration and Pipes comes up and often Pipes is absolutely the, the right and the, the first choice that you should be making because it, it's just damn easy to integrate uh, with Kafka. However, sometimes as Jeff mentioned as well, uh, pipes alone won't 
you know, meet the requirements. And I, I spoke earlier about these cloud migrations, customers currently on premises and starting to refactor and modernize in the cloud. Now you cannot deploy a pipe to your on-premises Kafka environment. Um, so that's, you know, one challenge. I just network, network gets into your way. And then also Kafka, um, Kafka users often use the Avro encoding schema just because of an efficiency, because there's so much data that goes into, into Kafka. So Avro is a very sensible choice. And uh, as of today, with pipes, we cannot easily uh, decode um, Avro messages. I mean, there are workarounds which customers also use using a Lambda to decode it. So it's technically possible. But there are some workarounds that you would have to do. And so we decided to um, build this EventBridge Kafka connector because in Kafka, there's a framework to integrate Kafka with other third party services and solutions. And that is called Kafka Connect. And it's very popular in the Kafka communities. And you know, typically it's the way you integrate with, with Kafka environments. And often um, customers have established processes and um, security clearance on Kafka Connect. So for them, it's actually easier to deploy a new connector into Kafka Connect than onboarding a new service, for example. So those are like many different reasons why the connector uh, can make sense in, in certain environments. And we decided to make this open source because why would we not? We are like, there's no secrets in, in the code there. It's using the public AWS SDK. We actually want um, customers and users um, to um, you know, interact, engage with us uh, on, on this GitHub repository um, so we can you know, co-develop and even get contributions from, from, um, from users, which we already have. So if you scroll down a little bit on the right, we already have Andreas. He's a very nice um, person and he started contributing because you know, he just loves the space. Andreas Gephardt, he's not from AWS. And, so yeah, so everyone is invited to to contribute and, and improve uh, the connector. Um, so Jeff, let me take it over from here. Let's see how this works. Dun, dun, dun. Ah, perfect. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. We can see your um your uh, okay. Console. Perfect. So I'll just start briefly with my current setup with my event bridge setup. And then we'll go into deploying the Kafka connector in two scenarios. One is a very basic scenario, just to get an understanding of how you deploy it and how you just send an event through Kafka to, uh, to EventBridge, which is just to learn um, the things, the steps that you, you would have to take. And then the other scenario is um, a change data capture, a CDC example, where we have a MySQL database and we use the Debezium project, which is um, a very popular change data capturing uh, solution to read the data from MySQL, put it into Kafka, and then subscribe to specific events and then sending them to EventBridge. And I'll clarify later a little bit uh, into detail of why we see or which kind of use cases we actually see um, with CDC and other um, Kafka patterns that customers. Yeah, it, interesting. In all my, I've been doing some other work recently on Kafka and I hadn't really come across the whole CDC integration. I mean, that's, Another thing that Kafka does, I mean, if you think, for, for example, how a DynamoDB streams, and that is using, you know, Kinesis exactly. technology under the scenes, well, well, yeah, if you could have that for other databases, use Kafka behind the scenes to do the, you know, the streaming of the data, very powerful. Yes, and Debezium has a lot of connectors, so I'll talk about this um, a little bit later. But um, yeah, exactly as you said, and, it, and it's very useful for data and cloud migrations, but also for integration use cases, as you said, with DynamoDB streams, it's kind of a similar, similar pattern here. So I have, um, I have an event bus set up, it's called Kafka Connect. And there's one rule, um, as uh, Jeff described, that we have these kind of rules, which are your filters and subscriptions, how you manage them in EventBridge. And the pattern here is I'm matching on any event the, where the source starts with Kafka Connect, where the prefix is Kafka Connect. And um, in our uh, connector code base, the source will always start with Kafka Connect, and then it has a specific suffix that you can, you can choose during deployment for, you know, for uniqueness of, of the connector. So that's, that's a very broad filter. Um, and that's, um, you know, just for the more purposes, you could obviously go much So basically anything coming from Kafka Connect, yeah, just do a pattern matching. Exactly. Uh, just while we are talking about the rules, Scott, thanks you. It was a question from earlier. You know, if EventBridge requires evaluating N rules, would there be an inefficiency with too many rules? 
So Jeff, I can, take, I can take that one. So and that's a fantastic question. So we actually have another open source library um, called the Ruler Library, um, which was created by, well, created by AWS, but there's a really, really smart person who you can see all over Ruler or if you um, search for it, um, who came up with a really um, interesting and simple um, algorithm to efficiently process many, many rules in a really, really short amount of time. So at the moment, um, we can practice in the lower thousands of rules very, very efficiently, very, very quickly um, in like the tens, like way below 100 milliseconds um, range, um, like tens of milliseconds. And we're looking at expanding this rule library to process um, even more um, rules in the lower thousands, get into like 10,000s or even above on um, this really efficient matter. So yeah, if you search for ruler, oh, Michael has it on the screen here. Um, you can take a look and um, see how the algorithm works. And the quick answer to your question is um, processing n rules is actually really efficient because folks did really smart things um, to handle that. Yeah, and the code is open source, which is also nice uh, on this yeah. on the on the ruler project here. Yeah. So if you question. see something that's not so smart, you can change it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, and so um, that is on the pattern, and then on the targets, like where to send these events, because as Jeff said, event versus router. Um, I have one target set up, and it's the most basic target, which is the CloudWatch log group because there it's super easy to see these events, um, the events shape, um, which we also want to talk about later here. But obviously you could have multiple targets. You could send it to a Lambda, to a stuff function, to a queue, uh, what have you. But just to let you know, this is your friendliest troubleshooting step. You're doing anything with EventBridge and you're wanting to know what's happening with rules, just log it natively to CloudWatch Logs Group. That is just so simple to see what's going on. And remember, you can have multiple targets. So if you are sending something to a Lambda function, you know you can send the same uh, you can send the same rule as a target to CloudWatch Logs Group, and then you can see, ah, oh, it's arriving in my log group, but uh, it's getting to my Lambda function. My Lambda function is doing something weird. Helps you to troubleshoot. So, yeah, put that in your in your tool chest. It's really useful. Yeah, and then you can set up the dead letter queue as well. If that like if you can't write to CloudWatch for for whatever reason, and I think setting this all up is so super easy, like subscribing, filtering, and routing in EventBridge is super easy compared to what you would have to do uh, as a, you know, as a Kafka developer writing the Kafka logic for that, which obviously on the Kafka side, you have like superpowers because you can do anything uh, with writing your Kafka consumers, but with superpowers comes also super responsibilities as yeah. we know. And so often we, um, we, <laughs> we often hear customers saying that, the Kafka core team is like all down Java, Kafka streams, everything, you know, Kafka producer consumer logic. But then there are other business units, other teams, data scientists, which just want to subscribe to specific events and then send them somewhere like to a Zenda ticket system or Salesforce. And for that, it's quite a mental leap to write a Kafka consumer um, to go to these systems, unless you want to use Kafka Connect and use a specific connector, say, to go to Salesforce. I don't know if one exists, but you could probably also do that. Uh, and there are some filtering capabilities in Kafka Connect as well. But I would argue, and I, I have seen both, that the, the way it's handled in EventBridge with rules and targets and dead letter queues and retries and timeouts, it's like just super easy. And we say it's like configuration over code when it comes to these subscriptions and filtering logic. And by the way, EventBridge can also transform your events. Um, in Kafka, it's called single message transformations, SMTs. And EventBridge, um, the, the, the language that we use there is a little bit more powerful and I would argue also somewhat easier to use. But again, some constraints around that. If you have more complex use cases, definitely do that in, in your Kafka environment. Okay, so this is the EventBridge uh, the, the EventBridge setup that, that I have, the, the custom bus, the rule, and the target. And now let's dive into the project. So as Jeff said, we have this open source page, EventBridge Kafka Connector. And on the releases, you can download our latest releases and artifacts. Those are Java archives, which you just deploy to your Kafka Connect environment. And that can be like an Amazon MSK Connect cluster or like your custom or Confluent managed con uh, Connect environment. 
everything is in this um, in these jar files, but you can also build it from source if you have some special modifications. All the steps are described here, including configuration options, um, how is the event envelope and the schemas look like, specifics for Avro, et cetera. Like it's pretty extensive here. We'll do a so quick- is, is that just a jar file you literally copy into a you know a file yes. path on your cluster and the yeah. connectors, yeah. well, the, the, the Kafka cluster is gonna pick that up and recognize it as a connector. Exactly. And, okay, cool. Spot on. Yeah, you can just download it. So, but in order to tell Kafka Connect what to do with the jar, because the jar has just, you know, the code, the logic, um, mm -hmm. but it doesn't automatically run, would be bad if it, if it would do it. You need to uh, also file or send a Kafka Connect configuration to the Connect cluster or to the Connect environment. And typically that's done through the API. There's a curl, a REST API and Kafka Connect where you can send this. There's also UIs where you can do it. I'm gonna do it through the U, uh, terminal. Um, but behind the scenes, it's all REST calls anyways. And there's this configuration syntax that we have to follow for Kafka Connect. And so every connector that you deploy gets a name in Kafka Connect. In this case, it's just event, event bridge sync JSON. Uh, that's the name that I'm gonna use for this connector. And so you can manage this connector by the name in Kafka Connect. And then there are a bunch of Kafka related settings so if this connector comes up and it has never like seen this topic that we're going to subscribe to, it's going to replay from all the events that are uh, existing in this topic. Then you need to provide this connector class. And that's the magic, Julian, as you just pointed out, is where now connect knows which Java class to load. And if that Java class is not um, available or not in the class path, it, it will, the command will fail. Uh, we'll make sure that it is available. And so the class that, that you need is th this one. And then you have you can provide a list of topics, Kafka topics. Again, this can be just one topic, can be multiple topics. Um, those are all Kafka Connect specifics, nothing specific that we are doing here for EventBridge. And then there are certain properties which are EventBridge related that are then being used by our connector. One is the ID. So we have this Kafka Connect prefix on the source and then you can specify your custom ID, which is then helpful if you have multiple connectors deployed in different environments or um, you know regions, you can then filter by this connector ID as a source. Um, then you need to provide the ARN of the event bus. So where this connector is going to send uh, the events and then uh, the region where the connector is going to operate. Any questions, Stream? No, I mean, is that it? I suppose, but, what, 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 how does authentication work then connecting into EventBridge or how does it even know where EventBridge is or is that coded within the actual connector? The yes, the EventBridge endpoint, I mean, yeah. Good, good question, yeah. So this is the most basic uh, configuration example that I have here. Uh, we have settings for providing an IAM uh, role, um, overriding the endpoint URI, if you have like specific environments, um, that uh, you know that have specific uh, event bridge endpoints. So there are a couple of options, configuration options, where you can influence the behavior, retries, yeah. for example. And um, the way authentication works is that we will we use the Java, uh, AWS Java SDK default methods for retrieving credentials. So it's going to look for uh, a config file, environment variables, um, yeah. you know, instance profiles on on um, on EC2, etc. So it's just go through. Uh, through the whole chain of environment variables. And then the two important Kafka Connect properties that you need to set is a key and a value converter because Kafka itself doesn't really care what, what, what it stores, it's just bytes. But obviously the producers and the consumers uh, need to be aware of how to read the data and write the data. And so in this case, the keys that we are gonna produce for Kafka are strings and the values we'll put in our JSON. Now I have a demo of later for Avro as well, but just in the sake, like for the sake of simplicity, we'll use string and JSON here as uh, this beginning uh, for the beginning. And then I'm going to show you how to run Kafka and Kafka Connect um, locally. Like this is all running on my on my local desktop. We have a Docker Compose file as well, where it will spin up Kafka, Kafka Connect and then a bunch of other services that you can use uh, locally. This is what we do for testing, but I'm, I'm not going to use this uh, local stack mock. We'll use the real event bridge, but you can reuse this Docker Compose file if you want to just play with that. And that's what I have here on my right side. So the terminal is probably a little bit hard to read for those on a smaller screen. So I'm going to explain. Michael's um, got lots of broad knowledge. So 
that's <laughs> needs to all fit on the widescreen. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the compliments. So I'm just starting the whole uh, Kafka and Kafka Connect environment here. So it's all loaded up. And I will start producing some events now while the connector is not yet running, just to show you know that it will catch up with, with the events while it's you know offline. So let's just produce some data in here. Uh, so I have this Kafka CTL command line, which talks to this local Kafka cluster and just sends data with the specific key, my key, and the value is a uh, timestamp, the current timestamp. So let's just dump a couple of records in here. Let's go to CloudWatch logs. We should not see anything yet because the connector is not running. And I'm just trying to show you that like no magic here, uh, no tricks. This is our log group is still empty. Nothing is uh, sent yet. And so we have four, I think four events in, the, um, in Kafka now. Let, so let's run uh, to connector. And as I said, it's literally just posting to this Kafka Connect REST API endpoint. In my case, I'm going to use curl and I'm providing this configuration file that you just saw. The jar file is already available here in, the, um, in my Docker Compose because I'm loading it through a Docker volume mount. Um, but you could also just copy manually copy it over there. So I'm going to run it, praying for the demo gods. So it's set, it's created. And uh, we see already some traces getting through here. So this looks all good. Again, there's not, much, not a lot of interesting stuff to see here in the console. We do have tracing support. So you see a lot of details on how long the, the, call, uh, the call took from event, like from Kafka to event bridge and so on. Um, but let's go to CloudWatch logs. And we have four events, the four events that we sent. So let's take a look at how this event looks like. When we designed the um, the connector for, you know, reading the Kafka data and then creating an event bridge uh, event from it, we were driven by how Pipes is doing it because we wanted to get as close as possible to the Pipes event schema that Pipes uses when integrating with Kafka, so that users don't really have, a, you know, if if they want to start with the connector and tomorrow want to migrate to Pipes they won't have a big breaking change. There are some nuances like small properties that we don't set here in the detail that Pipes does um, because they are specific to Pipes. But overall, we, we have kind of the same structure. And what you see here is we have an ID that is the typical EventBridge ID, which gets generated automatically by EventBridge. Then we have the detail type. And this is interesting because I have shown you the default, con default configuration. And in the default configuration, what we do is we take the topic name as an input to create the event detail type that you can filter on. So it, let's assume you have an orders topic, then the, the detail type here would be Kafka connect dash orders. Now we understand that some customers don't want this Kafka connect before. So this is all flexible, which means you can override the behavior of the detail type. You can just say just a topic name. You can say a specific prefix dash the topic name. You can hard code a string for like if you have five topics and you don't really care what the detail type is and say it's full bar, then we'll use this one. So that's pretty flexible if you have multiple topics. Um, and then, yeah, typically you would probably just use the topic name as an input or a prefix like we do here with Kafka Connect. And then on the source, I already mentioned that we have Kafka Connect as a fixed prefix uh, as the source here and then a dot and then is the ID that you saw in this configuration file. And so that's what you can use uh, for specific filtering. Say um, a developer only wants to read data from a specific connector, then you would use the source as well. Then a b bunch of other event bridge related stuff. And then we go into the detail and the detail is where the Kafka event is. Um, is we, we basically put the Kafka event. We have metadata part of the detail, which is the topic where it came from, the partition, the offset of this record, the timestamp uh, from Kafka, the uh, Kafka specific headers, if there are any, the key that we used, in, in this case, we had a key. If you don't write keys, um, then it's gonna be null. And then the value, and this is the JSON blob of what, what we sent in there. Uh, any questions so far? No, I mean, it sounds <clears throat> sounds easy. Yes, you're taking really Kafka stuff yeah. in, doing a bit of a, a bit of transformation yes. into a, nat uh, a native event bridge format, which is similar to what Pipes That's does. It. And yep. of course you can do, I mean, you did a catch all rule to grab anything, but you can search, I mean, what, that's one of the benefits of event bridges. You can pattern match on anything that's in here and not yes. just text matching, but you know, a whole bunch of extra yep. stuff as well. So very powerful. Keys, for example, yeah, specific yep. 
keys. Like the key would be a customer ID and you want to just filter on specific customer ID or prefixes like uh, critical uh, customers, important customers, VIPs, whatever, right? And that's, as you said, that's the power of the event bridge rule where you can literally go, I think it's thousand levels deep into the event and then just and filter on these specific values with like so you said a thousand or, levels deep yeah i think it's a thousand <laughs> levels like it's it's crazy like it's it there's a limit on on the rule of filtering it's documented could be wrong here but i'm pretty sure it's, it is a thousand. wow it's, yeah it's a lot it's it's crazy um and yeah 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 it's you you don't pay for the filtering the filtering is um what you get with event bridge uh, for free and that's that's what customers uh, when i was this, uh, when i'm in these conversations then um, you know different teams not kafka experts when they see how easy it is to write these subscription rules and filters and transformations and forwardings they they are immediately fall in love with this approach and the benefit um, of when when you deploy and use event bridge is that you can you're not constrained by just one event bus you if if you want to go across account or across region then a common architecture today is or a common pattern is to create multiple event buses say a central event bus where you feed all your kafka events into and then you have multiple event buses and different uh, organizational units that then they subscribe to the central event bus so only the specific events are being routed and transferred between those and you can use im to set up who can create buses and rules and subscriptions etc so that's super powerful um and, and flexible also from a security perspective yeah i think okay. that's a super powerful capability and i think uh, you know customers are i think start starting simply is i think generally what you know is always a good thing to to strive for and just you know going with a single event bus uh, but yeah multiple event buses hub and spoke models you know this is different yep. business units you know exactly. even different parts of your application maybe even different microservices you can have a big uh, big central event bus or big uh, you know, pulling things in from Kafka Connect, and then the details from the orders go to the order event bus, maybe in another account, maybe another region, and then, you know, get routed around. And then, you know, obviously you can, this can uh, become full circle as well, where you can then, uh, you know, do whatever you need to do from your uh, event bridge perspective, uh, transform, yep. move things around, you know, do uh, API destinations to, you know, do anything on the internet. I mean, it's ridiculously flexible. And then also put it back on the, on the Kafka, central Kafka event bus, for something else to take uh, action on as well. Yes, yes, exactly. Perfect. So this was the like the, the very basic uh, deployment, M more like focusing on how easy it is to deploy the connector. Again, for if you are a Kafka expert seeing this, that like nothing new to you. Uh, but we just wanted to make sure that it's damn easy uh, to deploy to deploy the connector. Now let me stop this local demo here for a second because there's not not really much to show beyond so and do you you have a separate kafka cluster and that was that demo was just the separate kafka connector yes it was, oh, okay. uh, so yeah it is so i had here locally running uh, kafka and kafka connect and ah, the okay. connector Damn. and i just t usually tear it up and or tear it up and tear it down for yeah, these demos definitely. um so i start clean from scratch and that's what we also use in github uh, in our ci pipelines so i'm going to delete the um the locks so that we are back to a clean state here no locks in here and now let's switch gears to the the Bezium, uh, example and uh, here i just need to make sure that my credentials are still valid uh, of course they are not so let's see if we can get to do this Doop -de -doop -de -do. nothing to see here Probably. I can yep. Give you again. give you a bit of time to sort out credentials and. Yep. Uh, no. No cache. Come on. Of course, the, this is live. We are serverless office hours. It's live. Yep. These things happen. We totally are secure. Live. You know, it's asking us for credentials again. It's a good thing. I think uh, AWS Reinforce is on at the moment. So yeah, sort of watching vicariously remotely with uh, so much good security information. So. Um, yeah, if you're interested in security stuff, yeah, have a look at what's going on at, uh, at Reinforce, our security-dedicated conference. So we're all set. So what I'm going to do now is I'm starting the Debezium uh, tutorial. So Debezium has a tutorial on the website. It's also Docker Compose, spins up MySQL, Kafka Connect, change data capture with Debezium and all the stuff. So we get basically a full Kafka environment as well with MySQL and uh, use some, some data in there in the database.
So this is going to take a little bit longer because there's more stuff to start. And as part of the Debezium tutorial, I need to deploy the Debezium connector as well. Um, I think it's this guy. I'm not going to show you the configuration of the Debezium connector. It's basically from, from the tutorial. The only thing that I changed and added there is I we are using the Avro, an Avro schema to encode the messages just to show Avro instead of just plain JSON. And we are going to use the glue schema registry, the AWS glue schema registry to store the schemas and retrieve the schemas. And that is uh, critical, especially you know in event-driven systems. The second questions that typically come are, oh, how do I make sure that the producers produce events that the consumers can actually read? And typically a schema registry is then being used with a like strongly defined schema. And here we're using the glue schema registry with Avro. I'm going to show that in a, in a second. So I know, I mean, obviously, so, EventBridge has its own schema registry. How, what's the decision tree that people should think about when they should use the Glue one? Well, so for Kafka, the only, like from an AWS perspective, the only schema registry supported would be the Glue schema registry. Um, Kafka, that is, okay. you know, by, by design, exactly. You can also yeah. use the Confluence schema registry. I think Red Hat also has one. Um, but in the Kafka land, those are the registries that you're okay. using. Yeah. And um, speaking of schemas, I have glue here and there's a there's a schema registry that i have and you can already see the schemas that the bezium auto generated uh, from the database table and created here in in, in glue and so those are the schemas that we're going to use for for Avro. yeah well for our, for our demo next so um mysql is running the connector from the bezium is running kafka is running there is data in there what we have not done yet is starting our connector to read the data. And there is a second configuration file that we're going to, going to use uh, for this setup. And you can see it's a little bit longer already because it has more settings. This is more uh, more like a elaborative uh, example. We, for example, we set a dead letter queue on Kafka. So I'm just showing some features here that you can also use in Kafka Connect, which is pretty nice. For example, if EventBridge cannot send an event to EventBridge, Maybe because it's malformed event, um, the schema cannot be retrieved uh, for whatever reason. Then we can also put the event back into a dead letter topic on, on Kafka for later introspection. Um, the more important things here are uh, the value converter. So for the values, we are going to use Avro. The keys are going to be JSON. The values are going to be Avro. And for in order for that to work, we give it a schema registry region region that's my region we give it a registry name that's the registry that i just showed you with all the avro schemas and then it's just going to be a generic record for the for the record type um, so that's the that's the default setting um, for the detail type in this case we're going to do avro demo avro demo dash topic because we are subscribing to multiple topics in this case we are subscribing to the customers and to the orders the the resulting detail types of these events will be avro dash demo dash orders or customers. And as I said, you can also overwrite this here by just saying uh, the detail type will just be the topic. Uh, you can influence that. And then the event bus ARN, again, is going to be the same. It's going to be Kafka Connect where we send this stuff. So this, you know, mostly settings is the same, just a little bit more on, this, on the schema side. OK, let's deploy it. Cool. I think something Avro. This should be this guy. Uh, so it's uh, created and let's see if we already have the data. Let's go to CloudWatch. Oh, okay, so there's some data in here. Let's just click one of the, um, one of the, one of the events that we got. So we have, this is an order. So we see DBC, DB server one inventory orders. That is all like from how DBZoom creates these topics. Um, the Avro test connector as the ID. And then I think what's more important or interesting is then the detail, like the payload that we get. In this case, uh, Debezium uses um, the order number as the key that you can filter on. And then the value, in this case, it's a create event because before the value is now, after it has a value for the order. So that means in this case, it was a create event uh, that we got from, from the database. Okay, and the thing here to note is that this is JSON. And what we do, what the connector does, it, it uses Avro to deserialize the, J, uh, the Kafka records, our connector, when it reads them. And then it uses a JSON conversion 
to send them to Eventbridge because Eventbridge today is JSON only. And that's why we see JSON here. And you can do the full filtering, like filtering on order number or a field that has an order number, for example, it doesn't have to necessarily be this number. Just say, oh, if there's a key, which is order number, then send it to the orders team or the accounts team or whatever. And what I wanted to show last in, in the demo is um, creating a user, like the connector is now running, we have, we've seen the existing events, but let's create a user and delete the user, how this looks like. And for that, I have two SQL commands that we're gonna use. We're gonna create a user Jane with an ID 1005, and then we're gonna use uh, delete this exact user. And this should produce three events, one for the create, one for the delete, which gives us a before and the after, and the tombstone event, which Kafka uses to say this key should be forgotten. And tombstone events are very useful um, for downstream systems as well to say, oh, this, this key is never going to come back or this user is never going to come back here. So let's um, exec into our MySQL uh, cluster. I think this is this one. Yeah, so here I'm, I have a MySQL shell and um, I created the user, I deleted the user. So let's go back to CloudWatch events. And if I do this stuff right, it's dot uh oh let me see i always forget the filtering that's the filtering syntax and cloudwatch logs so i'm going to filter all the events where there is an id 1005 and this should be three events yep so the first one is here it's that's the create one it's before now after is our jane and then there's two more events one is before is the value after is now so that's the delete event and the last one is the tombstone where you don't have a value at all. It's now, and the key is being set here. And this is what you can use in downstream systems, like for example, DynamoDB or wherever you want to use this to now understand that this like key should be forgotten. This is like a tombstone marker that Kafka uses as well. So I'm just going to pause here for a second if there are questions on the Ever demo. That it looks too simple to be true. It just uh, it works. There was no oh here's incoming Avro. Here's my parsing I need yes. to do or serialization I need to do. It's just oh Avro is coming in, spitting out JSON pattern matching, change data capture. I mean there, there's so many useful use cases for this. I can see. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean this can connect to you know doing CDC for I suppose a huge number of database vendors uh, and database products, and then yeah just send them to Eventbridge. Exactly. And the change data capture here is often used for uh, that our customers use for Salesforce integration. So for example, if a new user is created in a database to update uh, the, um, you know, or to create the user in Salesforce or update the address and say, or delete it or mark it as, as deleted in Salesforce or in your ticketing system that integrates with Eventbridge. So that's like super easy um, to integrate then because we have a native integration with Salesforce as well. The, I have well, one more remark, if time allows. Yes, we have probably 30 seconds, uh, half the time from Jeff, 60, but uh, we'll see how okay. we go. I have, a, <laughs> I have a small teaser here, which is sometimes when I do this demo, we see the tombstone arriving before the delete event, like the second and the third are sometimes uh, flipped. And that is because Eventbridge does not guarantee ordered or FIFO ordering yeah. um, as part of the delivery. And a lot of... Um, Kafka users that I talk to complain about this and say, oh, well, then I can't use it because I need ordering. And I'm just going to tease here that we will have a blog post uh, coming on why, first of all, ordering is not, not even guaranteed in Kafka because if you don't write order into Kafka, you also don't have order. But there are ways in Kafka to deal with these out-of-order records as well. And so there are ways to deal with them uh, in, in Eventbridge. And uh, we'll um, ship a blog post um, on this like exact topic of that you can still use EventBridge in these cases when you think ordering is a um, is a is a key requirement that you have, and so EventBridge does get to your way. Yeah, definitely. I think the whole ordering kind of thing is a huge can of worms, and obviously there are a lot of services exactly. which do support it. But even when services do support it, to make sure that <laughs> all your systems can follow ordering is a is a complicated job. So, um, so yeah, I just want to say, oh, Jeff and Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, uh, amazing to have the two product manager wizards talking about uh, EventBridge and Kafka integration. I know Kafka is super important in many people's lives. So it's so great there's now a, a connection with a serverless service. So Jeff and Michael, thanks for joining us. Thanks Thank for having us. Much. Don't forget uh, everything about serverless on serverlessland.com. 
tips, tricks, knowledge base. You can see on the front page, building event-driven architectures, lots of EDA stuff. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about some, some tooling to be able to uh, connect CR CD pipelines. So same time, same place next week. Jeff and Michael, thanks so much for joining us. And thanks for being part of our